The society of transparency is not a society of trust, but a society of control. There are not many things that pretty much everyone tends to agree on. We live in a world divided over so many issues. And yet, there seems to be a message you will find on almost anyone's lips, from the most ardent conservative to the most virulent social reformer. There is something deeply wrong with social media. It has been blamed for the rise in mental health issues among young people, political polarization, and the loneliness and ennui that seems to stalk the modern world wherever it turns. Despite this, we don't often think about the philosophy behind social media. Why, at the fundamental level, can it be so harmful? How is it that a series of pictures and words presented by an algorithm seems able to wreak such destruction on the human psyche? Well, in Byung-Chul Han's The Transparency Society, he analyzes social media as just one faucet of what he calls a culture of transparency. And here, we will see what it can teach us about the problems facing our world. Get ready to learn how we have all become exhibitionists, the effects modern life has had on our ability to connect with others, and how a demand for transparency can quickly morph into totalitarianism. As always, bear in mind that there is much about Han's work and philosophy that I cannot go into here, and I fully encourage reading him for yourself, as you'll almost certainly get a lot from it. But let's begin by examining the value system at the heart of social media and the terrifying message it sends to its users. 1. The Society of Exhibition In classic philosophical analyses of value, we tend to draw a distinction between the intrinsic and extrinsic value of something. This, intuitively, reflects whether something is valuable in and of itself, or whether it requires a relation to another thing in order to gain its value. For instance, human life is often thought to have intrinsic value. Even if all that existed in the universe was one solitary living person, many people would say their life still has some value. However, extrinsic value is the value imbued to an object by its relation to other things. So monetary value is often considered extrinsic because it is a matter of what people are willing to pay for a given thing. When there was a boom in demand for tulips in 17th century Holland, people were willing to fork over inordinate sums of money for the flowers. But nothing about the intrinsic properties of tulips had changed. It went up in price because people wanted them much more, while the supply of tulips could not rise to accommodate this. However, Hahn draws a subtly different distinction in values. He contrasts cult value, or private value, with exhibition value. The private value of something simply depends on the thing's existence. So, a sacred relic in the Catholic faith would have private value because it is revered or venerated simply in virtue of its being. Indeed, many important relics are only displayed a few times a year, they are often kept hidden, and simply to be in their presence is considered valuable. They are ways of getting closer to God, after all. But exhibition value is different. It is a particular kind of extrinsic value where something is prized for the attention that it garners. For example, sometimes in order to help advertise a film, a production company will perform a publicity stunt. They might encourage a lead actor to do something shocking or provocative in order to get more press for their film. Here, the value of what the actor is doing is not in the contents of their statements or in the act they are performing, but rather simply the fact that it's getting more eyeballs on their film. Or, to put it succinctly, exhibition value is the currency of the attention economy. Hahn says that we have become increasingly focused on exhibition value to the exclusion of other forms of value. This is part of his general observation that we are becoming more transparent, societally speaking. He uses this term in a number of ways throughout his essay, and it communicates a simultaneous abolition of privacy and a general flattening of complexity. A society of transparency demands that everything can and should be known and observed, but as a result, it refuses to look at those things that it cannot directly observe. For instance, they pretend that the depths and intricacies of human mental states just do not exist because their qualitative nature will forever be barred off. However, this emphasis on observation and making everything public goes hand in hand with the prioritization of exhibition value. Of course, there might be times where exhibition value is only appropriate. At a theatre show, the director will probably care about the contents of the show's message, but at the same time they will need to get people to watch it. And thus they'll also have to care about the exhibition value of both the show itself and its advertising. However, Hahn is worried about how we have begun to relate to ourselves through the medium of exhibition value. And the greatest examples of this are probably found on social media. 
For instance, I once knew someone who would take down a post on Instagram if it did not get a certain number of likes or views within an hour or so. In a small way, this was them acknowledging the primacy of the exhibition value of their post above any other metric. It was not that their main concern was the content of their text or the photo that they posted. It was rather that the content was just a means to an end of gaining attention. The exhibition value was the goal and everything else was subordinated to this. In itself, that's not the end of the world. It's just a post on Instagram. But we are increasingly incentivized to prioritize exhibition value in an ever larger portion of our lives. Most people who are involved with social media in one way or another will be familiar with this. The structure of the algorithms are designed so that you care who has liked your posts or how much attention your profile has generally got. This has become even more extreme in recent years, with the idea that someone should craft a personal brand which they can then show off to the world. And of course, since beautiful things get more attention, this has increased the already crushing pressure to be physically attractive. We've even got to the point where exhibition value is inextricably linked to the structure of the economy, where attention increasingly equals money. Hell, we are doing this right now. As you watch this video, your time is being measured by YouTube, who will then calculate how much that time was worth to them and give me a percentage of it. But Harm points out, the more money that can be made from exhibition value, the greater a role it is likely to take in our culture. But so what? Is that so bad? Well, some of the wisest thinkers in history on the subject of well-being have encouraged us not to place our measures of personal value on things we cannot directly control. In Stoic philosophy, this manifests in Epictetus's division between the world inside the mind and outside of it, saying we only have control over what is internal. In early Theravada Buddhism, we are encouraged to develop large enough internal resources to absorb the cruelty of the world like a great sea. In Boethius's The Consolation of Philosophy, he says that anything can be taken from us except the functioning of our mind and our ideas. And so we have excellent reason to place value on that as our final reserve for happiness. But other people's attention is patently not in our control. If we begin to judge ourselves by exhibition value, then we are placing our own value in the hands of other people. And moreover, not those nearest and dearest to us, the people whose opinions we already have respect for, but a nebulized, abstract form of attention. And this, in turn, has some disastrous consequences on our ability to connect with and relate to others. If you want to help me make more videos like this, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, where you can gain access to exclusive casual videos. The link is in the description. 2. Forced intimacy and no intimacy Many existentialist philosophers over the course of the 20th century placed a high premium on the idea of authenticity. Jean-Paul Sartre, Simone de Beauvoir and Albert Camus all at various points warn against becoming an inauthentic version of ourselves. By this, they meant someone who is alienated from their own values, freedom, and sense of meaning. For example, in many of Sartre's novels, characters are tortured by the fact that they are, in some sense, denying their own freedom and acting in bad faith as a result. Or, alternatively, that they are not following the value systems that really matter to them. Here, authenticity is often conceived of as a relation we hold to ourselves. We are behaving authentically when our deeper instincts, our conscious beliefs, and our outer behaviours are, in some sense, in sync. However, in recent years, authenticity has taken on a slightly more sinister meaning. It is increasingly used not to encourage us to relate to ourselves in a more fulfilling manner, but instead to bear more and more of our private thoughts and private feelings in the public sphere. To give just one example of this, let's look at the trends on TikTok of people taking deeply vulnerable emotional moments, either of themselves alone or with their loved ones, and then immediately sharing them with the world at large. In itself, there is nothing wrong with this individual choice, but in Han's view, it is very dangerous if it becomes a pattern, or even worse, a pressure. Because, for Han, when we bear our entire selves to the public world, we simultaneously develop a sort of forced intimacy with a whole range of strangers, while at the same time damaging our ability to connect with the people closest to us. This is a sort of counterintuitive thought, but stick with me, as I do think Han is onto something here. If we expose too much of ourselves in public, then the first thing that does is entrench the primacy of exhibition value we were discussing in the last section. It is taking a potentially incredibly vulnerable and fragile part of ourselves and assessing its value by the attention and scrutiny of others. 
It is delicate enough having your appearance judged by groups of anonymous people you'll never meet, let alone your most intimate emotional states. Yet, for Han, the demand for transparency entails this sort of forced authenticity. The logic of social media simultaneously requests that we be perfect and hide nothing. Thus, we become full of insincere sincerity, inauthentic authenticity, and ironic earnestness. We strip ourselves naked to the public gaze with the implicit message that there is nothing more to us than this. This is almost the perfect breeding ground for creating parasociality, the feeling that you are emotionally close with someone even if you've never met and are only really engaging with them as an object on a screen. Hahn suggests that the incentive structure of a society of transparency encourages us to turn ourselves into an object for the parasocial enjoyment of others. At any time, we must give the appearance of having nothing private or hidden to us, whilst also subjecting ourselves to the constant judgment of other people, who can freely decide to reject us with no consequence if they so please. Combined with the idea that we are judging ourselves based on our exhibition value, and you can see how this causes so much psychological and existential distress. On the other hand, Hahn is seriously concerned that all of this forced intimacy will damage our ability to form real closeness with others. For him, true interpersonal connection is built from a balance of hiddenness and openness. He is not alone in this thought. It is echoed by authors like Eric Fromm when he describes the paradoxical need to meld with someone while at the same time somehow recognizing them as a definite other, and that this is an essential component for love and intimacy. Hahn talks about this otherness as well. He thinks that by turning ourselves into exhibition pieces, we run the risk of keeping too little of ourselves hidden or just for the privileged access of those we love and care for. At its most extreme, he fears this will turn into a sort of self-destructive narcissism, where everything we do is not in service to others or even really to ourselves, but to this strange exhibition of us that we have created in order to absorb the attention and adulation of other people, without caring who those other people are in the slightest. But we don't need to dwell on such extreme examples to see Hahn's overall point. Aristotle once said that if someone is a friend to everyone, then they are also a friend to no one. Here he recognizes that forging a genuine intimate connection with another person involves first realizing that they are different to you with their own thoughts, feelings, and desires, and then taking the extra leap to value those thoughts, feelings, and desires over those of other people, and sometimes even your own. And arguably, part of this is reserving some of our hidden aspects for only those people who we truly wish to connect with. For Han, the more we lay out on the table for public consumption, the more we turn ourselves into a makeshift art exhibit, an object purely for the enjoyment of others, rather than a full agent who can form genuine bonds with other full agents out there in the world. Han states that this interplay between revealing aspects of ourselves to other people while still hiding other parts only to possibly be disclosed later is an important component to what he calls the eroticism of interpersonal connections. It is what maintains our agency as we consciously decide who we are going to open up to, to what extent we will, and why we have chosen to do so. The demand for transparency, the total naked display of our whole self to the whole world, robs us of this freedom. And this leaves us both incredibly vulnerable and made into a sort of obscene object with no part of us left unobserved or only observed by a chosen few. Ultimately, Hahn worries that if we continue down this path of forced public intimacy, we are taking some of our deepest and most fragile parts and commodifying them so that other people can dine on the buffet of our deconstructed soul, all while we become ever lonelier for lack of committed connection with real other people. Whether or not you think things could go this far, Hahn's general message is definitely worth listening to, especially as we're incentivized to be more and more vulnerable in the online public sphere. What is the cost we pay for all this exposure? And with this level of transparency comes another insidious effect. It's something thinkers have been worried about for centuries, but this time it might just come into fruition. 3. The Uninformative Deluge in Jorge Luis Borges' The Library of Babel, we are presented with a sort of hell, consisting of an infinite library containing every possible combination of letters that will fit in a 410-page book. The problem of the people living in this hell is not a lack of raw data, they have quantity of information in droves. But any denizen of this universe lacks any way to make sense of the information, to sort through it in a way that brings what they are interested in to the surface and leaves the rest. 
they just have bare, unadulterated volume, and it would drive many of them mad as a result. This is a pretty good articulation of just one of the ways in which Hahn thinks a society of transparency has altered our relationship with information. We now have so much of it that it's becoming a problem. For much of human history, information was a pretty scarce resource. Books were often quite rare, and literacy rates were so low anyway that accessing the information within the book was its own challenge. But today, we often have the opposite issue. We are constantly bombarded with far more information than we could ever take in or process, and this is increasingly centralised around social media platforms. With 41% of 18 to 24-year-olds in the UK describing social media as their main gateway to news. But Hahn has a series of concerns about this situation, which he thinks will undermine our ability to engage with much of this information in any meaningful way. For a start, he observes that within a culture of transparency, more information is considered better, often without much regard to its quality or utility. This does not necessarily come from a place of malice, but it has unfortunate consequences later down the line, both at the social and individual level. First, on a broader scale, it incentivizes mining as much information as possible about other people. This is most obvious at the corporate level, where customer data is a hot commodity precisely because if you know more about someone, you can better predict what they are likely to buy. Additionally, the attention economy means it is often advantageous to just produce some shocking information that will get a lot of clicks, rather than considering the value of the content of the information itself. Hahn thinks we are incentivized to produce and collect insane levels of information, as well as share enormous amounts of data about ourselves, and this is not necessarily a good thing. Secondly, the excess of information means that it is impossible to give each individual piece its requisite level of care, attention, and respect. In his other works, Hahn talks about the value of dwelling on single ideas for a long time. He praises the sort of gentle, exploratory concentration that emerges when we allow our mind to slow down and occupy itself with a single object. However, if it is more profitable to have our attention flitting from one shallow piece of information to the next, then we are completely robbed of this experience. We only have time to view something, make a snap judgment about it, and then move on. The flow of information deprives us of deeper kinds of engagements with ideas, like insight or experience-trained intuition, because we're often not given enough time to reach these levels of thought. Hahn is not saying that this has become impossible, but rather that social pressures run entirely counter to this, and if we're going to recapture this ability, we will need to make a concerted, conscious effort to do so, flying in the face of an established incentive structure. And this is hard. It is similar to an observation made by Danish philosopher Søren Kierkegaard in his essay The Present Age, where he predicted that an excess of information will lead to just as much confusion over what is true as a lack of information would. As Hahn puts it, Today, the growing mass of information is crippling all higher judgment. Often less knowledge and information achieve something more. By this, he certainly does not mean that having a paucity of information is a good thing. It is rather that too much information with no sense of what is reliable or important or valuable means that we will become overwhelmed rather than informed. Kierkegaard predicted this would encourage an attitude where people are very reluctant to commit to any position. He thinks it will incentivize an aesthetic view on information, where the quantity of information becomes a good in itself rather than just one step along a search for truth. Deprived of the ability to establish what is the case, we would instead try to just have the opinion that is the cleverest or the most in vogue. After all, if we can't get a clear view on how things actually are, we may as well take the most socially advantageous position. Additionally, Hahn is very sceptical of the way algorithms increasingly guide the information we have access to, suggesting that this is likely to create increasingly isolated and divided bubbles of people. It is not just that we are bombarded with information, but specifically information that we want to see. We are kept in algorithmic cages which reinforce our own views and only expose us to opposition we have indicated we desire. This does not necessarily mean we take pleasure in seeing this opposition, but rather that we react to it in a way that encourages engagement, either becoming angry or frustrated or ridiculing the oppositional viewpoint. Either way, we are not exposed to other views except when we have implicitly encouraged it with our own prior behaviour. Thus, Hahn thinks we are encouraged to become a sort of intellectual narcissists, shaping the world we see around our pre-existing beliefs rather than the other way around. While we have always had cognitive biases, they are now exploited and played to on an unprecedented scale, and Hahn thinks this will have 
disastrous consequences. As we become insular and isolated, while at the same time exhausted from the constant stream of information blasted into our synapses at every waking moment. But his unsettling proclamations do not stop there. Perhaps Hahn's most dire critique of the Transparency Society is not just that it is unpleasant or ruins our ability to connect with others or reduces us to images, but that it is fundamentally totalitarian in nature. 4. Transparency and Control If you've got nothing to hide, then you've got nothing to fear. This is the general logic behind an awful lot of surveillance programs. Hahn traces the sentiment back to Rousseau, who suggested that citizens should be totally open about their activities. Because, ultimately, they should not be doing anything that would attract social censure if it were discovered. One reason Plato had the ruling classes of his city live in one big communal building was so that they could all keep an eye on one another. A lack of privacy is meant to guarantee loyalty and good behaviour. Surely anyone who was a morally upstanding person would not mind people knowing everything about them, considering that they would only find good things. For Hahn, surveillance used to be the primary domain of the state and an expression of asymmetric power. Think of Stalin's NKVD or Robespierre's Committee for Public Safety. These were systems of surveillance and punishment which used the vast resources of the nation to enforce a certain set of laws, principles and ideas. The archetype of this is Jeremy Bentham's Panopticon, where a single central guard can watch any prisoner at any time. So, in practice, everyone has to act like they are being watched at all times. Hahn says this is no longer a complete description of the way surveillance works in the modern day. For a start, he points out that much of the data we give on ourselves is handed over semi-voluntarily as the price for using various online platforms. We fork over some of our information, often including the contents of our messages, and we get to use Facebook or Instagram or the like for free. There has also been a shift in the underlying logic behind much of the monitoring. Whereas in the past, reasons for surveillance had been to do with morality or maintaining political order, now Hahn thinks they are mostly economic. For the most part, we are not surveilled to be thrown in prison, but to make a profit. Hahn is not suggesting that this is worse, just that it's different and that that difference is worthy of note. Obviously, having someone sell you something and being thrown in a gulag are incomparable in terms of their emotional consequences. Next, Hahn points out we've gone through a real decentralization of surveillance. In the past, it was simply not practical for the everyday citizen to surveil another everyday citizen. We did not have the technology. The only groups with the tools necessary to conduct surveillance campaigns were government intelligence organizations. But it's fair to say this has changed. I am hardly the first to point out that we now walk around with the kind of easy access recording technology that would give Lavrenti Beria's corpse localized rigor mortis. But Hahn goes one step further and points out how this fundamentally changes the power dynamic of surveillance, while not really making anyone happy. On a huge number of occasions in recent years, we have seen people recorded and posted online without their consent, with the added implication that they are somehow worthy of scorn or censure. From alleged infidelity to airing family disputes to accusations of rude conduct, we have become very used to seeing the fruits of homemade surveillance pinned up on social media for all to see. In effect, Hahn says we are not just surveilled from a central position, but instead have become used to surveilling one another. And any objection to this comes up against the old totalitarian mantra, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to fear. Only now it's not coming from a secret service agent, but a teenager on TikTok. We are still denied privacy on a massive scale, but now we are given the consolation of being one of the prison guards as well as one of the prisoners. And it is this social pressure to be open and transparent, to not just be surveilled, but consent to being surveilled, that marks out the situation as different. To quote Hahn directly, The society of control achieves perfection when subjects bear themselves not through outer constraint, but through self-generated need. The need to put oneself on display without shame. At this point, we could take an Orwellian route and talk about all of the negative aspects of living as if you're being constantly watched, or invoke Kafka and Sartre on the existential fear of being observed. But instead, Hahn takes a unique angle on things. He discusses how extreme transparency erodes a very precious resource, trust. For Hahn, mutual trust is at the heart of the logic by which we allow others to be free and gain freedom ourselves. Someone's motivations, desires, and planned actions are hidden from us, and yet we trust that they will not harm either us or other people. 
This means that we can allow both privacy and freedom, confident that this will not put ourselves or our loved ones at risk. But Hahn argues that a build-up of trust relies on a certain lack of information. In a culture of surveillance and transparency, we become unable to establish trust because most people would behave well if they thought they were being watched. Thus, Hahn suggests that rather than promoting trust, transparency is only necessary when we feel unable to trust. And too much information will breed suspicion about what someone would do if they weren't being observed all the time, thus reinforcing the motivation for surveillance in the first place. Sometimes this is only appropriate. We might not want to trust our governments to behave without being kept in check by an informed populace because the stakes are so high. But there is danger at the interpersonal level of not only eliminating trust, but also the means to gain trust. Hahn argues that a culture of recording one another and sharing it, meaning that every private moment becomes potentially public, is trading in a very significant freedom for an incredibly paltry one. In the freedom to live unrecorded and unjudged, we gain the ability to play with ideas, craft our characters, reflect, think and speak freely, and have a break from the crushing gaze of the other that can cause us such stress. And in return, all we are given is the ability to take someone else's freedom away. What is the freedom to surveil compared with the freedom of not being surveilled ourselves? It's a bit like being told that you're about to get beaten up, but not to worry, in return, you will also get to beat someone else up. It is a recipe for resentment, anxiety, and paranoia, and the only people who have anything to gain from it are the spiteful and those making money off it. Hahn spends more time crafting diagnoses than solutions, but if we were to take something away from his essays, it might be this. The axiomatic goods of a transparency society, that more information is always better, that something should be judged by its ability to retain attention, and that privacy is inherently suspicious. These things should be held up to careful scrutiny. We should be hesitant about accepting them wholesale and instead consider them as we would any other broad sweeping statement about how society should function, carefully weighing up the pros and cons before giving our assent or our dissent to them. Because if Hahn is to be believed, we are playing a dangerous game and the stakes are as high as the very concept of a private life. But if you want to see how Hahn turns his philosophy on another significant aspect of modern life, then check out this video to explore his analysis of modern work. And stick around for more on thinking to improve your life.